today, we will be talking about designing Wi-Fi for challenging environments. And we have a super extremely special guest. We have uh, Francois. Uh, Francois, my friend, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me for this webinar. Excited to uh, you know talk with you guys about challenging environments. I know I'm not the only one doing Wi-Fi in challenging environments. You guys have done it in the past. Uh, Stu actually helped me in the past too. So um, it, yeah, it's going to be an exciting um, subject and a lot to talk about. And would you like to just tell everyone where you come from, what do you do, and a little bit about yourself, and then we will crack on. Sure. Uh, so my name is Francois Verges. I'm uh, originally from France. Um, I studied um, my university over there, uh, specialized in networking. Then I moved to Canada, uh, where I started to work as a network engineer. Uh, and I quickly found you know, a passion for Wi-Fi and started to specialize in Wi-Fi. Uh, and now I work as a Wi-Fi engineer. Um, I work for a company called Symphio Networks. Uh, we offer professional services around Wi-Fi technologies in, in Canada for the most part. Um, and I've been working in, I guess I've been fortunate enough to work in different type of environments. That's actually one part of my job that I, I really like is the fact that I work uh, for different customers that are you know, op operating in, in different uh, industry, different verticals. So I get to see the behind the scenes of a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of things, um, including, you know, challenging environments. We'll talk about that. And, and customers do tend to call me whenever they have a challenge with their Wi-Fi. Uh, so I rarely get called to do easy uh, Wi-Fi installations. Usually when they call me, it's to, uh, to do a little bit more complex stuff, which is, you know, very exciting for us um, as engineers. Um, yeah, I also, uh, um, I also co-host the, the Clear to Send podcast. If you guys don't know the podcast, uh, just taking the opportunity to, to, to do my little ad here, but, uh, <laughs> I did as well, the only show we talk about Wi-Fi every other week. Um, so it's a Wi-Fi podcast. If you guys are interested in checking that out. And what a podcast Absolutely. it is. Every time I travel around the Europe, like to Poland and back, I'm listening to you guys. And last time I listened to, I don't know, like 25 episodes back to back. So <laughs> Familiar with your without, voice. Without getting yeah. a headache, so. <laughs> I had a headache after it finished. I suppose the other thing to, to mention as well, Francois, is that you're also an ECSE instructor, and I can see in the chat, that actually a few of your students are here with us as well, that you've taught previously. Yes, exactly. I've been uh, teaching the ECSE class for, I think, uh, a little over three years now, uh, ECSE design, and uh, I also teach the ECSE advanced class. Um, for the most part. Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. Well, then we can crack on. Amazing. And let's not forget about our sidekick, Stu. Stu, welcome, my friend. How are you doing? I'm doing amazing, Mac. And you know what? This is a great webinar to kick off 2022. Super excited. Francois, amazing to have you here. Um, you know, I'm super excited to get started. Like the, the, I can see the, the questions are going to start rolling in pretty quick. And I even got one that's coming up and I know there's going to come up a little, we're going to answer a little bit later. And it's about designing for, um, you know, not very many channels in a con particular environment. So we're going to hold that question to later, but uh, keep those questions coming in folks. And I'll get them queued up to, to Mac and Matt. And of course, actually Francois. So put that in the chat and I'll be. Uh, Thank I'll you very much. Steve. Amazing stuff. All righty, Francois. Stage is yours. Yeah, so the, the first thing I guess we should uh, define is what is a challenging environment for Wi-Fi, right? Because uh, Wi-Fi could be challenged by a lot of things. Um, and, you know, when I, when I think about changing environments, the first thing that comes to mind for me would be uh, the two environments I have here, manufacturing plants or factories. Uh, so places with a lot of big machineries, uh, you know, uh, a big building, sometimes with very high ceilings, uh, moving parts, uh, a lot of metal. Um, so these space could be quite challenging. Uh, also think about warehouses, you know, a whole bunch of racks, distribution centers, these type of places. Uh, and they can be quite challenging for Wi-Fi as well, because you don't necessarily know what, what you're going to have in the racks. They can move around uh, as the you know, the, the, the company grows, you can ex expand the building or add more racks. Um, and that becomes, you know, quite challenging for Wi-Fi as well. Um, 
So these two environments are, you know, the first one that comes to mind. Um, um, and, and I've worked, you know, I've worked on multiple of these different factories and warehouses. And I've seen, you know, I've done like cheese factories, which was interesting for me as a, as a French person. Because for me, Why cheese was is made in a... Fun. Yeah, but was yeah, it, was it for, smelling? It, yeah, but not the, not the right smell, right? <laughs> But to, to me, cheese was, you know, made in a farm and, and you had, you know, the, the cows and, and you would just let the cheese grow with time. That was my idea of making cheese. And then I went to the cheese factory and, and I, I thought the, I guess, the industrial way of making cheese. Uh, but, you know, I, I've seen car, you know, plain factories. Uh, I worked in, in steel factories as well, as well cosmetic factories, um, distribution centers. Um, I've even worked in distribution centers that have to keep frozen goods so it's like big freezers big fridges so a whole bunch of environments that could be you know quite challenging for wi-fi so, uh, we'll try so francois when you was at the cheese factory what type of cheese had the biggest attenuation when you were doing your wi-fi testing <laughs> the, one so with no the, hole in. the only cheese they were producing was the uh, you know the big uh, cheddar uh, block of cheese that you buy at supermarket that was the only one they were producing so um and they, they had a tiny space in the factory to actually store all the type of cheese but they were not producing them at the same place so i guess i can't answer your question yeah. <laughs> um but it's interesting it's interesting to see the <clears throat> the behind the scenes um and then one thing i wanted to mention as well and um and, and maybe you guys can comment on that as well, is, you know, you could also have other challenging environments for Wi-Fi. So you could have large outdoor spaces, very high density spaces like stadium or, you know, large public venues. Um, you know, I'm thinking about uh, airports, convention centers, these, these type of places. They could also be very challenging environments, maybe not for the same reasons, but they could also be very challenging for, for Wi-Fi. Um, so today we'll, we'll kind of focus on the manufacturing environment, plant and warehouses, but just keep in mind that you, you may also have other environments that could be very challenging for Wi-Fi for different reasons. Can an office environment be considered a challenging environment? It could if you have uh, like a multi-tenant uh, office environment. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, the, the startups uh, incubator that lets a whole bunch of startups work together in the same space. If every startup that comes with their own Wi-Fi system and you're already in a multi-tenant building, then that could be challenging, right? And throw in so. a big massive atrium in the middle as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bumper of glass. You can make any environment challenging for Wi-Fi, right? <laughs> when you work with Matthew, everything is. <laughs> what about you guys? Have you have you worked in, in any of these environments or? Yeah, well, one of the uh, challenging environments that I worked in in the UK was actually a company that makes baby formula and, and milk. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, even just accessing the different areas to be able to do like validation testing or, you know, maybe doing like an AP on a stick or any kind of, you know, survey in those environments. Because it's baby formula, you had to wear like a hairnet, a beard net, you'd have to wear a gown, gloves, mm -hmm. like foot covers, and then... I remember as you would like step over from one area and you cross over to another area as you're like mid crossing, you've got to take off one of your uh, protective mm -hmm. foot covers and swap it for another one. Oh, and whilst you're doing that, by the way, you've got to hold your iPad or your laptop that you're using as the survey device, taking off your thing at the same time and try and put on another one. So that can be quite challenging. So um, yeah, that was, uh, that was quite fun. Those kind of environments. Yeah. Mm. And I was working for a massive recycling plant or recycling plants, uh, a little bit uh, similar to your cheese factory, so not the right type of smell. And that was also fun. Tons of steel, tons of, of like engines, electrical stuff, uh, Campbells mm -hmm. and things like that, and high temperatures and high shock and dusty and tons of chemicals. So yeah, we have. So do you want to move to the next slide, uh, Mac? Of course. Awesome. So if we look at, you know, some of the challenges we may have in these environments, um, you know, we have a couple of obvious ones. Um, you, you, could, you could have a lot of reflections. Uh, so you could have reflections from, you know, we often think about reflections from the racks, reflection from the, the machinery we may have. Um, I worked in a, in a factory last year where they were producing hydraulic um, arms. 
So it's pretty much, you know, steel as an input. And then they work on the steel with big machines, and then you have steel on the output. Uh, so it's a it's a big it's a big uh, you know reflection factory. Um, but we also you know sometimes we also forget about other type of reflections. The one I, I tried to mention is the uh, the floor uh, reflection because concrete can actually reflect quite a bit. So in in these big environments, sometimes you have big open spaces, concrete that can also reflect the signal. Um, and so when when you think about the reflections. We'll, we'll try to see you know, how we can combat all of this, but uh, also try to keep in mind where the, the client devices are being used to try to see if it's really an issue or not for what you're trying to do and, and try to see if you can um, you know, uh, work around it or um, again, measure and assess you know, how much you have. <clears throat> then you could have signal obstruction. So a lot of elements that will obstruct the signal uh, you know, it could come from big machinery. It could come from uh, big parts that are moving inside the environment. So if you're working in a, like a, I don't know, a plane factory, they're going to move planes across. <laughs> so obviously it's like big, you know, steel boxes moving across your environment. So you have to think about that. Think about where they're going to move um, and, and, and think about how you can design your network without having the signal being too much Im impacted by those movements. Obviously, it's going to be impacted, but try to reduce the amount of um, uh, a negative impact you can bring on your design as much as possible. Um, and then also in these environments, sometimes you can have very busy ceilings. I'm sure you guys have been there where you have a whole bunch of ducts and, you know, electrical pipes and, you know, AC units and you name them, cranes. Uh, that you have like under the ceilings, uh, which gives you very busy. As well. Tons of, yeah. uh, like I've been under the ceiling with tons of ducks and cranes flying together with these beautiful birds more than once. How about you, Matt? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah and, and sometimes you don't really uh, notice it, you know, as a network guy on site doing your work, you don't really notice they have like a crane or something under the ceiling. So you have some time to pay attention because if you're planning on, you know, installing an AP, and then the a crane can come and crush it, then that's a problem. Um, yeah, I was gonna say so, it works, it works both ways. Uh, you know, you don't see the cranes and they don't see the APs. And like you said, we've worked in many examples where you've deployed an access point or an antenna in a certain position, and all of a sudden you get a complaint saying, Oh no, the Wi-Fi is not working, how it should be down aisle 10, or whatever. And you go down there and you look and you see the antenna that was straight down the aisle is now completely facing in another direction and it's all bent, and you think, oh. And I wonder what happened here because, you know, when they pick up the stock off the rack and they raise up the, the stock on, mm -hmm. the, on the crane and the forklift and they're, they're driving in and out, you, they might not see your antenna or your access point, how you mounted it. And then it changes what orientation it is, which then impacts your design. So, yeah, we've been there, done that quite a few times. Also worked in environments where we've had uh, yeah, animals landing on the uh, access points and um, causing them nice. to have some issues and stuff. So <laughs> that's uh, another challenging uh, environment sometimes to, to be working in. You have an idea for your upcoming webinar right there. Funny <laughs> Wi-Fi stories. Um, yeah, so that's that's something to keep in mind, all of these uh, obstructions. And sometimes it will impact you know, where you can actually install your equipment, where you can install the APs, where you can install the antennas. And you have to think about you know, alternative solutions. Um, so I usually frame that as AP installation limitations. And that's always something I would discuss with uh, the customers is, you know, where uh, will we have problems uh, installing AP as equipment? Um, you can also think about cables, like where we will have problems, you know, running a cable to. Um, and you can just use these limitation into your design uh, decisions in terms of where you're gonna place the AP. Um, and how you're going to mount the AP, uh, and you could, you know, try to work on alternative solutions uh, of, of of where you can install the equipment. Uh, there's there's always, you know, a solution, always a way to install the equipment. Sometimes it's not, you know, the best way of doing it or the more optimized, but we can usually find different ways. And maybe I can show you a couple of examples uh, later on. Um, of course, sometimes we. Yeah, sometimes what can be a challenge as, as well is the size of the building. Um, so I recently went into a factory where, you know, it, when you enter in it, you, it was huge. You could play, you could put like multiple football field in it, no problem. So, you know, the first couple of times I, I went in there, I was like, wow, it's huge. 
And so you have like big ceilings, uh, you know, high ceilings, um, a whole bunch of things happening. And sometimes the size can be an issue uh, for, you know, for the, for the Wi-Fi signal, understanding your cell, the cell size, you know, which antenna you can use, which antenna would be the best for the job. Uh, that can make it quite challenging in, in these environments. Um, uh, so what you would you typically do in this, in this situation then, Francois, when you've got super high ceilings and, um, you know, is there, uh, let me frame it another way, is there a kind of like a cut off height where you wouldn't use a, an access point that has just integrated omnidirectional antennas, for example? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, if, you, if there is a certain height that you kind of avoid and stuff, like what do you do when the ceiling is way higher than that? Like what, what can we do here? Yeah, so yeah, this is usually when you start using directional antennas. Um, and then the height of the ceiling might impact the gain that uh, you want to use on your directional antenna uh, to make sure that you have proper signal uh, on the floor and make sure that the AP can hear the client uh, devices as well. Um, to answer your question on, you know, when do I stop using integrated, uh, you know, integrated omnidirectional antennas in my APs? Um, in those environments, I try to, um, you know, avoid using them if it's not uh, a typical ceiling height of, you know, let's say 2.53 meters. Um, uh, I, I try to refer to external antennas as much as I can. Um, external antennas, it's, it's um, you know, sometimes when you've never used them, they can be a little uh, scary, but as soon as you start using them, you can stop using them. <laughs> Because they gives you a lot of flexibility and, and better results. Um, so what I, what I maybe I can show an example later. But what I do sometimes is not use an omnidirectional antenna, but not necessarily the embedded omni uh, you know omnidirectional antenna that you could have in a, in an AP. But I use like an external antenna that's an omni um, for some scenarios. And um, they actually have antennas now that um, you that they call the down tilt omni. Uh, where you could get like an omnidirectional pattern on the horizontal view, but then most of the energy is directed down. So you could install these antenna in a little higher height and still get proper signal on the floor in these environments. So what's the difference, Francois, between a down tilt omni and a high-ish gain patch? Uh, that would be, I guess, the, um, you know, the, the footprint of the antenna, the pattern. Because with a down tilt, uh, if you take a down tilt, I have an example here. Uh, this is a down tilt antenna omni. So if I install it under the ceiling, uh, I'm going to get like some, somewhat of a circle on the floor for my antenna pattern. Now, if I'm using a patch antenna, um, I have a patch antenna here, and I'm using this one facing down under the ceiling, then the pattern I'm going to get on the floor will not necessarily be a circle, right? In this case, it will more be like a rectangle. Uh, so the the... I guess the shape of your of your Wi-Fi cell, if you want to call it that way, uh, will be different depending on which type of antenna you you use. And we can actually use Ekaha to kind of model all of this and and, and compare, um, you know, what type of um, uh, coverage you can expect to get depending on which antenna you're using. Um, we'll do that during the demo, so it makes a little bit more sense. Um, Something I wanted to mention as well is, um, you know, for the challenges, sometimes we can have um, a challenging a challenges based on the environment, like you know, the temperature and the humidity level in the building, right? And that that can have an impact on which equipment you use. Maybe you might not be able to use like you know an AP that you could use in an office environment. Maybe you have to use you know an outdoor AP for that environment that could. Uh, that could operate in, in, in higher temperature or lower temperatures. Um, so sometimes you have also have to think about these elements in these environments. Uh, so what I, what I put at the end of the slide is we can't solely rely on the predictive model when we're doing designs for these challenging environments. You have to go on site. You have to go on site. You cannot just, you know, Yes, like this, right? With your finger and mm -hmm. test the, <laughs> the direction of the wind. You have to go on site. You have to get a sense of the environment. You have to look around. Uh, and this will allow you to see all of this, see all of the obstructions, study your AP installation um, uh, um, uh, limitations and, and try to find solutions. Um, and moreover, it will help you to you know, measure some signal and test different antennas and, and find out which one is the best. 
for what you're trying to do. And Francois, you brought up a really important point because even on actually kind of our, our feet on the street here with the, with the chat zone here is that we're seeing that is, you know, um, in, you know, putting in different types of antennas and understanding the environment because you have to kind of understand the challenges, right? So that you can model that you know, properly. So what you see, you can actually build that within the software, right? So if, can, if I can take what I see um, in a specific environment, such as a warehouse or challenging outdoor amusement park, whatever, I can then model that within Ekahau, right? So that I can get it. And of course, even we got one um, a shout out here is AP on a stick. That is a, an amazing thing. And we can do that within our software. And I know not to plug the software here, but I mean, on Ekahau survey, we can do that, right? We can put up those antennas, map, you know, understand the differences between um, that great example you brought up with the uh, the down tilt Omni, not a lot of folks use those, right? I mean, sometimes they think of just the Omni as the standard dipole, right? Or the monopole, which is different, offers different. So, you know, as you say, antenna um, choice helps in a lot of these design matters. <clears throat> Yeah, exactly. And, and talking about AP on a stick, Mac, if you want to go to the next slide, I feel like I have an assistant. Uh, thank you, Mac. <laughs> I'm your PA man. <laughs> um, so yeah, so if you, if we think about you know the the typical life cycle of a of a Wi-Fi project, uh, first of all, we focus on gathering the requirements, understand you know what what we are building, understand you know some of the limitation, understand how the customer will use the Wi-Fi network, and then we typically move to the design phase. And this is where we use Ekaha to model the environment and try to figure out exactly you know, how many APs we'll need, which type of APs we'll need, which type of antenna we'll need, where we would place them in our environment uh, so we can actually later on install and deploy everything. Um, and here, when we're designing with changing environment, um, it's a very good idea to do AP on the stick. I always do AP on the stick in these environments. Uh, because there are some, some elements that you, we're going to have a hard time modeling in the software. So we want to be able to measure it on site so we can you know, model it as much as possible or as close to the reality as it is uh, by basing our model on our real world measurements. Um, so you know, API on stick will allow us to you know, measure the signal propagation in the real environment, understand how the machinery is, um, how you know the racks, uh, how the different elements impact the signal propagation, and so we can feed that. That later on we can feed that data back into the design, into the the model uh, to kind of refine the model and make sure that you know the the design will work um, when we actually deploy it. Um, another thing with AP on a stick is that you can actually take the opportunity of being on site to test different antennas. If you're not too sure, should I use antenna A? or antenna B, you can actually go on site with both of them and study both of them and see, okay, which one will be the best for the job. Um, and, you know, it might not always be the antenna you thought uh, would be the best for the job. And, 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 then, and then you can just figure that out uh, on site when you, when you actually measure it for yourself. Um, so and like you job, said, you can do all of this with a cow. When you're, uh, when you're doing your AP on a stick, testing or validation on site, do you typically just lock your sidekick down to the channels that your AP on a stick access point is using, or would you keep it open to scan all channels so you can capture more of the environment? What is your uh, preferred method here? So my preferred method is to only uh, listen um, on the, the channels that I have my AP on. So I only listen, if I have my AP that I use for the AP on a stick using channel, let's say 11 and 149, I'll just fix my psychic to only listen on these channels and, and, and focus on the signal I'm getting from that AP. Actually, I'll, I'll show you a little trick in Ekahau when we do the demo that you can use in Ekahau to, uh, to actually visualize the signal strength you're getting from your AP that you're using from the AP on a stick uh, directly inside the UI. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you guys how I do that. Another oh, quick question that. about the AP on a stick. Uh, sorry, Matt. If you are designing for a single band, do you disable a radio that you don't use for, the, for my battery. you mean for my ap that i use for the ap on the stick Correct. um not necessarily because i don't it could be broadcasting but if i don't listen to it or if i don't scan that channels you know who cares uh it's just going to be broadcasting in the environment but uh usually i don't do it because 
I have my like I have my AP on it, my AP that I use for the AP on the configured uh, using like a pre can configuration, I guess. Um, so I can just leave it the same. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Yeah. So usually what I would do is before going on site to do the AP on the I will just give it a chance and try to do the predictive model as best as I can. And when I go on site, you know, as I take my real world measurement, I can actually go back to my, my, my predictive model and adjust it as I go. Um, so, so you can actually be proactive on site while you're on site and decide on site which you know, measurements you, you want to actually do, where you want to do them, and just uh, uh, go like this. So it's like an iterative process to me. Uh, and to me, that's critical for these environments. Uh, I would never be, you know, even after being designed for these environments for, for a while, I would never be comfortable, you know, sending a design to a customer without doing API mistakes for these environments, especially when you start using uh, external antennas. Um, another thing that's great, another benefit of API mistake is that you actually get to test, you know, if the antenna you've planned for your design is able to connect to your AP, make sure that, you know, they have the proper, the right number of cables, the proper connectors, uh, and you can kind of make sure that what you're proposing in your design will actually be implemented, implementable. I don't know if that's a word, but it will actually be feasible in the real world. So that's okay, another benefit. Quick, quick two questions there uh, from the audience that caught my eye. Since we are talking about the AP on a stick and how do you want to use it and, and why and stuff, how many different mini surveys around the AP on a stick you do in a typical, let's say, warehouse environment? <clears throat> I'm not sure I understand the question, but it's like, so how far do I walk? That's... So let's, let's, let's say that you have a typical warehouse that is, I don't know, like 100 meters wide and 500 meters long. Mm, okay. And that you plan to use like, I don't know, 30 or 50 access points in, and you have your AP on a stick. How many different AP on a stick mini surveys around the AP on a stick do you do? You place it in one place and then you walk around and then you just get the feeling about that and go home, yeah. or you move it to different places, freeze the access point in Ekahau, and then you do multiple mini surveys to have, uh, I don't know, more detailed picture of the environment. What's your best practice there? <clears throat> yeah, so what, what I like to do is I like to study, um, before I do the API on a stick, I like to study the environment, try to understand, okay, what do I have? Do I have like different racks? Um, you know, and what do I have in the racks? Do I have a mezzanine? Uh, do I have an open space with machinery? <clears throat> and then for each of these environments, I will define a couple of locations uh, that I want to test out. And usually I try to select like, you know, location of potential adjacent APs. So I can also study the overlap between my Wi-Fi cells. So that's why I, I kind of like, so if I have like 10 racks, you know, I would maybe do two or three measurements in the two first aisles. Uh, so I can kind of study, you know, the signal progression pattern in, in these type of environment. And once I have a good grasp of it, you know, I can kind of replicate that in my design for the rest of the, of the racks. Does that make sense? Of course it uh, does, thank you very much. Yeah, so it would depend on the environment and what they have. If they have different machineries, I would, I would do AP on a stick. And sometimes like when I worked on that, you know, uh, hydraulic arm factory, um, you know, they had a lot of different machineries in different environments. And I ended up, you know, doing AP on a stick measurements for maybe 80 or 85% of the APs that we ended up installing over there. So sometimes you may have to do a lot of AP on a stick because of the environment, because you don't have any other choice to, to be sure of, of uh, that, that your design will meet the requirements. Do you want to move on to the next slide, Mac? Sure. Okay. So we have a poll, so let the poll read the poll. The question is, what part of the Wi-Fi project lifecycle is the biggest challenge? And we have multiple uh, questions. There are option A, gathering requirements. Option B, performing on-site wireless surveys. C, physical AP installation or mounting. And D, identifying client devices. Some uh, good choices to choose from there. And we'll just let the uh, 
the poll answers roll in before we finish the poll and then share the results. So um, there was one kind of standout winner, really, which was gathering the requirements. So, um, you know, getting all those details from your customer up front seems to be one of the bigger challenges people seem to have is, you know, finding out what what devices they're going to be using, what they're going to be using it for, all of this kind of things. So, Francois, you were sad because you didn't get to vote. So what would have got your vote if you could have voted? Would have voted. <clears throat> I would have voted the same thing because I think it's 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 critical uh, part of the process because it can, um, you know, impact you know some important design decisions. Uh, so it's it's kind of like the foundation of 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 it all. And it, I agree that it can be challenging because, um, you know, Wi-Fi is easy; it just works, right? So the customer mm -hmm. is not expecting to receive like two pages long of questions <laughs> uh, when you're designing Wi-Fi for them. So sometimes you have to do a little bit more you know, uh, education and, and explaining of what you're trying to do to, uh, to get the message through. So it's not always easy. Yeah, very good. Cool. Next slide, Mac. Yeah, so let's talk about, you know, some of the technical solutions before we do a, a little demo in, in Ikaha, you know, what, which uh, tools that we have in our Wi-Fi engineer tool belt could we use to help us in these environments? Um, the big one is uh, directional antennas. Uh, and directional antennas are nice because they can help us to kind of focus the signal in different uh, uh, directions, and that can help uh, greatly with reflection. Mm -hmm. I remember working on this project where uh, I came in because Wi-Fi was not working. It was a small uh, cooler; they called it the cooler warehouse. Um, but they had a lot of a lot of reflection, and they were using omnidirectional antennas, uh, APs installed under the ceiling, about eight meters high. Um, and when we measured, uh, when I measured the, uh, you know, the signal, signal was okay, but then we had a lot of retries, a lot of frames were retried. And, um, and I think we had about, um, I think 30% retries, something crazy like that. So, uh, we, we studied everything and all we pretty much did was changing the, the antenna. So we removed the omnidirectional antennas. We changed them for directional antennas. Uh, the amount of APs they had was pretty good. Uh, the location of them was pretty good as well. And then we were able to, you know, uh, decrease the uh, retry rate to something like 5%. Um, so just the fact of, you know, using the right antenna, uh, you know, kind of help us a, a great deal here uh, with the reflections. And sometimes it's hard to grasp because, you know, we don't see the Wi-Fi uh, waves. It would be nice to have, you know, glasses that allows us to see the signal. Um, <laughs> but we don't have them yet, right? Unless you guys are starting a startup uh, and want my money, but uh, wouldn't that be uh, nice? <laughs> that would be nice. We don't have that yet, so we we kind of have to use you know some of the knowledge that we have and use tools like Ekaha to kind of help us visualize everything. <clears throat> um, and and directional antennas can be nice as well if we have very high ceiling to help us make sure that the signal actually reaches the ground and make sure that you know, the, the antenna can also hear the signal coming from the client devices. Um, uh, what you can do as well is use alternative mounting solutions, right? So if you have, and, and that's something I've done in, especially in factories, sometimes you have high ceilings, but everyone is working on the floor with you know, machineries that are very small. So you have this big gap between you know where the people are and the ceiling so what you can actually do is lower down the ap from the ceiling so you could use like an electrical pipe or something like this and then install an access point uh, and maybe a, an, an antenna uh, outside of this uh, at the end of this pole and, and now you have tons of solutions to do this um, i actually have a little uh, kit here that i kind of like it's from a, a company called uh, oberon and then you can you actually have the they have the opening for the electrical conduit and then you can just slide in your ap in this case it's a cisco ap but you could you could slide in whichever ap and uh it's nice you don't even need the ap bracket you can just install this and it's very easy for the installers to kind of install that at the end of the electrical uh, pipe um so that could be an option you could also do uh you could go the, the cheaper route if you just take a threaded rod and then the electrical uh, box and usually they have, you know, the screw holes that will match, you know, the screw hole of the AP plate. Uh, so you can actually screw the AP directly on, 
on, on this stuff. So you could do stuff like this if you want to lower down the AP. And this could also allow you to use maybe AP with internal antennas uh, without having to use uh, directional antennas or external antennas in some cases. So this could be nice. You could also I have another mount here, which is the L bracket. This one is from Ventev, and you can install it, you know, um, on a wall or you know on a column or on something like this and this one is nice as well uh, because you can just install the ap underneath so these are you know a couple of tools you can use to kind of mount the aps in different directions uh, you can also get now what they call co-location mounts where you can actually you know install the ap and the external antenna on the same type of mount and then attach this under the ceiling uh, these mounts are actually pretty nice sometimes they also allow you to kind of pivot uh, the part where the antenna is connected, so you can uh, give some tilts and, and orient the antenna in, in the proper direction. So I don't have any to show you here, but uh, if you search around, you, you, you'll find and you'll see what I mean. Like a mini uh, warehouse going on there. I was wondering if there's any any parts for a Wi-Fi you don't have. Yeah, probably. <laughs> As we are discussing like mounting solutions and different types of antennas, a quick question from the audience is: When do you use directional well not directional when do you use omnidirectional antenna that is external to the access point why do you use external omni when you can use internal omni instead a question for me mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'll, i only use in my case i only use external omni as if it's a down tilt omni other way other if i can reuse the omni in the antenna i will just lower down the ap uh, i think it makes the installation easier uh, but to answer your question, you could you could have a need for a high gain omnidirectional antenna, which would give you more. It gives you more like vertical coverage. That's the thing that's kind of counterintuitive. Intuitive. So, but if you I have can, a, uh, yeah, tell me about. I was gonna say I can I can think of one other reason, Mac, and uh, we worked on this project together actually, and it's for aesthetic reasons. So there's been many offices in, in London where we have deployed Wi-Fi 4, and for some reason, people get offended by these beautiful white access points. They don't want to see them. So what they want to do is they want to stick the big white box, it's not that big, above the ceiling, and then use a discrete, low, like really thin, omnidirectional flat panel antenna underneath yeah. the ceiling. So it's, it's, it's more... Yeah aesthetically pleasing and it isn't I'm not as... shocking, Matt. i remember this project it was like good five six years ago and these yeah. were beautiful meraki access points they are really good looking uh, but the antennas they have i don't know different shape uh, meraki ips were rectangular and the antenna was a uh, perfect uh, round circular shape and maybe like half half an inch thinner that's all it was yeah so you know it could just purely be down to uh, aesthetic reasons why you choose to use an external omnidirectional antenna rather than an integrated omnidirectional antenna for your access points and you know one other thing to add there on that is that is is don't be afraid to choose a, a, a an external antenna whether it's a directional or omnidirectional there's always a way to make it aesthetically pleasing there's always something there is um, there's a number of uh, uh, vendors out there that can make those antennas look completely like, you know, invisible, right? There is one that actually makes them right into a light standard um, that you wouldn't even know it's there. It's inside the light. Um, there's even another one that you could put inside, hide it inside, oh, I don't know, on top of a ticket booth, right? Um, maybe in the ears of a character or something like that. So <laughs> you can you can be very creative um, to... Um, uh, to, I guess you can say, to meet the requirements, uh, Francois. I think that we always talk about that. Meet the requirements. Did it meet the requirements? Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, exactly. Next slide, please, Mac. Yeah. <clears throat> Bef uh, yeah, I know we're, you're short on time. The, the last thing, Matt, before you, you ask the question um, is I had like used the right equipment for the job. So this is what, this is more like related to, you know, make sure you use the equipment that will, sustain you know whichever temperature you have in the space or you know make sure you're using the right gear like I, I, i've been in warehouses where i've seen uh, consumer grade ap's or you know uh, you know not the right ap that you would expect to, to for this type of environment so just make sure you use the right equipment for the job as well that's important 
Sorry, Francois, I'm just getting excited to learn all these tricks and live demos that you've got lined up for us inside of Echo House. So I need to make sure we get to them. So we've got another another poll for uh, everyone now, which we are going to launch. Okay, uh, so Paul is reading a poll. Uh, what wireless technologies are you designing for and working with in your challenging environments on top of Wi-Fi? A, BLE, B, ultra wideband, C, private 4 or 5G private cellular like CBRS or similar or the other and you can put it in comments. Yeah, so if it's another type of technology, then please feel free to drop it in the chat and we'll take a take a look at that as well. Just whilst we um, give everyone a little bit of time to run through answering this poll question, dying to know what Francois you would have voted for as well. What would you have voted for Francois if you could have? Well, I guess it depends on the use case, um, but I can talk about one project that I'm, I'm working on uh, where we're trying to do BLE location, actually in a, in a distribution, distribution center. Uh, so I would maybe right now would have selected BLE. So I guess I'm not the only one. Yeah, BLE seems to be uh, pretty uh, popular, 46%. 46 and then closely behind was uh, private 4 or 5G, like CBRS or similar. And then actually private cellular is higher than I expected it to be. Yeah, it's getting um getting more popular, it seems now the uh, private cellular, especially in the uh, with the, if you're working it in the Wi-Fi space. And on the well, other hand, like we're talking uh, sorry, Steve, go on. Sorry, I was wondering even part of the CBRS, you know, how much that is in the equation as well, right? That's uh is slightly different. So but uh, that would yeah. have been my answer. So and I'm quite, quite surprised that ultra wideband is that low, especially in challenging environments. I, I was expecting it to be a little bit uh, higher, but yeah, fantastic to, to know. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to demos. So I will stop sharing the screen now, Francois. Do you want to give us an intro about what you're about to demo or do I just stop sharing? You can stop sharing, we'll get right into it and we can just talk as we go. Uh, let me just, I took over now, so just so you know. Okay, so I have this little floor plan. It's, it, it's a very simple warehouse. I have a couple of racks uh, and I have some empty, empty white spaces and we'll try to kind of model different things so I can show you a couple of tricks here um, of how you could you know, uh, use Ikeha to help you in the process of designing for this type of environment. Uh, the first thing I like to show is you know, how to deal with external antennas in Ikeha. <clears throat> and uh, what I like to do is I usually like to add uh, an empty map, right? I just called it a white background here. And I like to scale it to something quite big. So I'll scale it to, let's say 150 meters. Uh, and this allows me to just drop an AP and study the, the radiation pattern of that AP. Uh, and it's not impacted by any of the, you know, attenuation areas that I would have in my design. And I can really study the propagation pattern of a, of a given antenna. So here I could add an AP, you know, for instance, I have, you know, this AP here, uh, missed AP 32, it has an external antenna, as you can see, and, and then I can see the propagation pattern. And this antenna is actually the one I have right here, right? By default, Ekaha is, is just gonna show us the signal propagation just as if we have the AP on the wall. But if I want to install the AP under the ceiling, then what I can do is I can you know, click on the details and the settings of my, AP, of my antenna here, my AP, and I can change the mounting to ceiling. And now it's gonna place that antenna under the ceiling. I could increase the height if I want to, to install it like maybe on an eight meter, an eight meter warehouse. Uh, I could do something like this. And then when I quit this menu bar here, I can see the signal propagation that I will get, right? Um, so this is what I would get if I have my, my antenna like this. And now what I can do is if I want to just rotate my antenna 90 degrees, for instance, well, I can simulate that in Ekaha by just dragging and dropping these little arrows. And then I can kind of study what type of, you know, propagation pattern I'm expecting to get. So I'm going to actually, I'm, I'm going to increase the scale a little bit. So we have a little bit more room. And so what I can do as well from here is I could, you know, study, change the external antenna and try to see, okay, what, what I would get if I get, if I use a, a different uh, external antenna. So what I do here is I just copy paste my AP object 
it gives me a second AP object. And then I can go back into that sec second AP object and I can change here, looking at the antenna dropdown list, I can change which, which antenna I want to use. So I'm going to use these uh, omnidirectional, you know, down tilt antenna that I have right here. And this is the one that I have right here. I'm going to select the same one as well for five gigahertz. And here I can study, you know, what type of signal propagation I'm going to have from this guy if I install it at, you know, eight meters high. What if I lower it down, you know, six meters? Boom, you can kind of study the difference uh, between, you know, installing antennas at different heights as well. So you can see the shape to kind of, you know, circle back on your question, Mac, earlier. You can kind of see the shape of the signal is not exactly the same uh, as you use different type of antennas. Um, I want to show you another one as well, which could be useful in some environments. So I've copy and pasted it. Um, and this other antenna is this guy here. It's a 13 dBi antenna. Sometimes we call it the warehouse antenna. I'm going to put it under the ceiling. Uh, and this one is, is quite nice because it gives you a very narrow um, slice of, I call it a slice of RF. Um, so you can kind of, you know, shoot the signal only along your aisle if you put it above um, a, um, a warehouse aisle. I'm just trying to grasp, grasp it properly. And so this one could be useful if you have very long aisle and you want to you know, provide the, <clears throat> the, the right signal, you could use something like this. It's a little bit bigger. I have one here, so it looks like this, right? Uh, but you could definitely use something like this and you could model it in Ekaha just like this and, and study uh, what you get. I'm actually going to bring it up to eight meters under the ceiling, uh, for instance. And you, you can see, you know, the different type of um, uh, patterns we're going to get using the different antennas. And so once I have this, I can go back into my actual design. I could actually model my racks. I can use, you know, uh, attenuation areas. I'm just going to use the default one we have in a gal here to kind of get uh, some meat to our design. If you want to learn how to do this, you should attend the ECSC design class. Here you go, Matt. I did. I did the, the a great plugin. If you uh, yeah, if you want to attend the ECSE uh, design class to uh, you know learn some of these cool tips and tricks and how you design Wi-Fi for these challenging environments, then you could head over to the Ekaha website and you'll be able to find out more details on how you can register for one of the up and coming ECSE classes. Maybe even one with Francois. Yeah, that was a great. Exactly. That was a great plug. That was good. <laughs> um, if you want to be sure to have me as an instructor, just sign up for the one in French. You'll, you'll trick <laughs> if you understand French, obviously. Okay, so now that I have my, my, my racks in my environment, what I usually do is I go back to my background and I select the AP that I want to use. So maybe I can use this guy here and I just copy it, Control C or Command C, and then I paste it into my design. And I, you can kind of see now, you know, how the elements in your design, we can impact the signal propagation. So here you could see that, you know, it might be good enough for these aisles. Uh, maybe for the aisles that are longer, I want to use uh, the other antenna. So I could go back here, select the antenna with the, um, uh, the antenna with the a little bit more focus pattern, and I could place it into my environment and then try to see what I get. And you can, you can kind of work on your prediction like this as you go. Uh, one thing to note here, if you do something like this is, and something I, I try to always keep in mind is, you know, the, the flow of the people and the flow of the equipment that are going to navigate throughout the warehouse. And if you do this, you notice that, you know, at the end of the racks, you know, you're not going to have, like, if you have a forklift going down this way, for instance, they're going to have to roam into each of the APs that you have, you know, in the racks, which is not, you know, optimal. Uh, so maybe you want to install an AP in this area. So forklift kind of, kind of attached to that AP as it navigates inside this area. Um, so on top of you know, installing APs to make sure that you're meeting the signal requirements, it's also important to make sure that you have, um, you, know, you, you understand the roaming, the flow of people, the flow of devices. So you also have APs that you know, devices can attach to as they navigate the space without generating 
um, a whole bunch of roaming that we don't really need. So for instance, here I could install the one with the down tilt uh, Omni. Um, and I could install maybe another one up there. So this is, this is the little trick I use to study my antenna propagation, because as you can see, once you have your attenuation area inside the design, it's hard to fully understand the pattern of your, your, of your antennas. So that's one little trick you can use. Um, second thing you can do is if, you, if I go back to my attenuation areas, I can actually create free form attenuation areas. So you have, if you have like a big machinery uh, that I want to kind of model in my environment, I can actually add here by clicking on the plus, I can add a new attenuation area, I'll call it big machine. Um, and then let, let me change the color to we'll make it red. And I could change the attenuation, maybe it's five dB per meter. And then now I can just can create my machine that has a very specific shape uh, and I can kind of design this and try to see how much impact it's going to bring me. Uh, what I did cheese? here, sorry? Was this your cheese? Yeah, the, the, cheese, uh, <laughs> the cheese producer. Yeah. Um, so here, what I didn't mention, uh, uh, modify is the height. So let's say we change it to like three meters. Uh, so you can kind of see how that's going to impact your signal. So that's one thing I do. Uh, sometimes you can uh, model my my big machineries, and then I would adjust, uh, you know, the these values, the dB per uh, per meter attenuation value, based on my AP and stick measurements. Another thing you can do as well is, let's say I have like a corner office here in this factory, but only on the second floor, and I can actually go underneath that office to store some items. Uh, what you can do, you can actually model that second office attenuation. Um, and I'm going to go here and add a new, uh, add a new attenuation. Uh, we'll make it maybe 8 dB here. And here, instead of modifying the height coming from the ceiling, you can actually modify, uh, you know, the how much free space you have below that big attenuation area. So here I could say I have like three meters below that attenuation area, and I could model it maybe in in brown, and then I could kind of draw that second floor office here. So if I move that AP, for instance, closer here, you can kind of see, <clears throat> you know, and try to see how all of this will impact the signal propagation. So this is, you know, a couple of tricks I used to, uh, to kind of help me model the environment as much as possible when I do, when I do this in, in Ikaha. Um, another little thing you can do uh, in, in changing environment to document how you're going to install the APs. I'm, I'm a big fan of the tags, uh, which is a new feature that came with 10.2. Uh, Stu, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that is correct. So that's, that's a pretty neat feature and you can kind of define any tag you want. So if I, if I, want, to, if I want to install install all of these APs, let's say under the ceiling or under the ceiling trust, I can you know, select them, which I just had them selected. And then I can go to action, edit multiple access points. I can add a tag and I could call it uh, installation type, for instance. And I could say, you know, under uh, ceiling trust, for instance. And so when I do this, when I press OK, it's just going to add this tag to all of my APs. And when I create my documentation, I can reuse that data uh, to send back to the customer, to the installers. And you can be very granular. You can create your own tags. I mean, on the design that we work on with my colleague, we have sometimes, you know, nine tags, different tags to document different things. Uh, so it's a very useful feature. Um, do I have time to show the API stick trick, Matt? You tell me. Go for it. It depends. <laughs> okay. So for the API on a stick, let's see if it works, because I think I have an AP that in my office that runs a survey SSID, so I'll show it to you. Guys, you. just, just a quick, quick, not a plug, but just a quick reassurance. We will take some questions after we finish the webinar. So, so yeah. stay, stay for a little bit longer. So let's say I'm doing AP on a stick in this environment. Um, you know, I'm going to navigate to the survey tab. I have my psychic connected. Um, and here, what I do uh, before doing my AP on a stick measurements, assuming I'm doing it with Ikahau, 
I would go to my RTFM view, uh, the real time frequency monitor. Uh, and here I will just filter for my survey at society and it will show me you know, which channels are used by my AP. So here I can, I can see on five gigahertz, I'm using channel 149. If I navigate to 2.4, I can see my survey society is on channel 11. So now, now I know exactly which channels I need to scan in order to listen to the signals coming from my AP. So I can go back to the settings all the way to the top right hand corner here of my adapters, and I can configure my psychic only to listen on these two channels, channel 11, and I can use a second NIC to listen on channel 149, right? And this will kind of save me time. The Wi-Fi NICs and the psychic will just only listen on these two channels. And if I want to see, you know, the signal levels I'm receiving from, you know, my, my AP on these channels, instead of looking at the RTFM view here, what you can actually do is click on the SSID tile all the way at the top of the Ekaho application here. And you can uh, select the manual option and navigate to the survey, your survey SSID. So that's the one I've configured on my AP. Uh, and then you could you know, select if you wanted to see the 2.45 gigahertz signal. Most of what I do now is five gigahertz. So I'll, I usually select five gigahertz. And now when I look at the signal strength tile, uh, I'm seeing the signal that I'm getting from that AP. Uh, so as I walk around, as I walk away from my AP and as I measure the signal, I can visualize the data directly into Ekaha. Uh, if you prefer to use the iPad application, uh, you could actually have you know, both 2.4, you can actually visualize both the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz signal strength uh, of your survey SSID as you, as you do your survey. That's it for me, Matt. Great, yeah, great, uh, great tips and tricks and uh, thanks for those demos great, there. Great plugs. Yeah, Mac, if you could uh, share your screen and go back to the slides. So we've got a few things to announce, actually. And um, so, yeah, which we're quite excited about. So <clears throat> whilst Mac's just uh, getting it up. Okie doke. And I am sharing now. Okay, so first of all, what we want to announce is some ECSE scholarship winners. So uh, a massive Ooh. congratulations to um, JJ Berger and um, Dave Vivian. So um, thank you very much for everyone who submitted your uh, essays for the scholarship. Um, we whittled it down to just two out of a lots of great applications. So it was really hard to get down to these final two. Um, but congratulations, you'll be contacted on how you can um, come in and attend one of the ECSE design classes. And if you would like to apply apply to maybe have the opportunity to win on <clears throat> the uh, next opportunity we are taking uh, applications now so uh, if you go to the link below which is echohow.com training forward slash uh, ECSE scholarship you can go there and find out the details on how you would apply to the ECSE scholarship program so again big congratulations to the two winners and if you would like to get involved then please do so so uh, and the next slide please Mac hey guys congrats the quality of your application was mind-bending it was awesome next slide oh there we go thank you so much um sorry back one, one more slide sorry credibly okay um so something for the ecsc students the uh, past present and future um keep an eye out because we have partnered with um credibly and that is how we're going to be uh, issuing digital certifications moving forward you will also if you're a previous ecsc um student you will get uh, the certificate still sent to you so you can add the badge to your account so when you've received the email just uh, make sure you know that it's not spam and it is actually an association with ekahal and so feel free to make sure you add that to your account um, you'll get a couple of emails coming out over the next couple of weeks but we will be using it from uh, early february so thank you very much and then yeah final slide please mac we couldn't have our first webinar of 2022 without giving away some of the cool ekahal swag and uh we've got 15 of the ekahal hats to actually give away and if you want to if you want a chance of uh, entering to win some of this swag all you need to do open up your phone scan that qr code and post the tweet embedded inside that qr code and we're going to go through and randomly pick 15 winners who has posted uh from that qr code that tweet so if you want a chance of winning your hat make sure you scan and you post so oh, guys we'll if you that. want to have a chance to answer the questions that you have asked during this webinar 
tons of the answers will be there. It's a great guide. It has great technical value. So I personally encourage you to, to read it. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, really, uh, really great uh, guide we've got there on the, how you get the three steps to great Wi-Fi every day. So uh, hopefully that's enough time for everyone to have scanned the QR code and posted, and we're going to go and check those winners uh, later on during the week. Okay. Okay. So we, then... can, we can leave the slide on the on the screen. So before we close, uh, we appreciate that we are running out of time. It's like three minutes past. Uh, but let's answer like top two or three questions before we close, and then we will stay for a few minutes longer and answer even more after we stop the recording. So if you don't mind, guys, Francois, top question from the audience. I've voted. We have a question from Antonio and he asks us, how do you handle an environment where there is heavy Zoom usage over Wi-Fi? So this steers us back to the challenging office environment situation. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a good question. That, that's not related to, uh, related to what we've talked about today, but that, like you said, it's a, another challenging environment. Um, so for this for these environment, even in an office environment, if you have like a lot of high density of, of users, you can actually also use a directional antenna uh, to, but this way to focus the, the signal in a smaller cell, right? Um, so instead of having omnidirectional uh, antennas where the signal just blast everywhere, you could actually use patch antenna even in an office environment to limit the spread of your signal and kind of contact create smaller cells. Uh, so you could you could kind of support a higher uh, amount of devices within your your Wi-Fi cells and have a better reuse of your channels um, and and increase the capacity of your network so you can you know make your Zoom calls better. Yeah, great answer, mate. And it's underappreciated how much it can change to actually use directional antennas instead of sticking to traditional omnis that you're used to seeing uh, on the ceiling every day. And this leads to another question about the same environment. How do you define a deployment as high density? What would be, what would be the high density environment? How many devices or what, what channel utilization you need to have in order for you to decide, all right, this is high density? If you're asking me personally, um, mm -hmm. I would say that if I'm expecting more than 100 device connected to an AP, it's high density. I'm, I'm not talking about active clients. I'm talking just associated clients. That's okay. kind of my, my cutoff, but other people may have other cutoffs. If you ask me, I would say if you have high-ish channel utilization, that might be considered high-ish mm -hmm. density uh, yeah. sustained. You so you would like to clients. probably have... Yeah. Okay. So this is answered. And one last question before we uh, before we... Uh, close, we have a question about the uh, signal strength offset when uh, simulating. Uh, do you use, Francois, offset feature while working on your challenging designs? So when, <clears throat> when I work on the predictive model, you mean? I don't I know. I guess that's a signal, yeah. So when I work on the predictive model, usually I don't use the offsets. Um, I found that ACA is already pretty close to what I'm going to see on site. Um, oh, I use the offset to compare the measure as the signal I measure, uh, let's say from the psychic to, um, you know, to, to my, to my design, to my predictive model, if I have to, that's how I would use the offset. So I'll use the offset on the survey data, not on the predictive data, if you will. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you very much. And uh, Stu has uh, marked one question to be answered live. So you have my word now. Last one before we finally close. Uh, in Indonesia, there are just four channels available mm -hmm. on five yeah. gigahertz. How do you cater for high-ish density there? Yeah, that's a good question, right? And then that might be a, a big limitation. Um, I thought you were gonna ask me, how do you handle that in like a warehouse environment or a plant? <laughs> Um, I've, I've done warehouse environment with four channels when we had limitations, some other limitations, and that could work, you know, if, you, if you're using uh, directional antenna, that's going to help you with the channel we use. So you could, you could, uh, you know, in these environments where you don't have like crazy high density of client devices, you could get away with, you know, four channels, even if you have a lot of APs, you can just reuse them and the directional antenna will kind of, you know, contain your signal. Um, in, in, in an environment where you have a high density environment and only four channels available, well, the, 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 you know, the channels would be your limitation, right? 
Um, so you could use the directional antenna to the, to the best of your ability to contain the signal as much as you can, but you may have, you know, you may reach a limit there uh, because you only have four channels. So, I mean, if, if wireless doesn't work, what do you guys do? You go back go to home. wired, right? <laughs> 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 we always have the wired option, right? No, I, I don't Switch know. Switch off and on again. Yeah, switch it on, off and on again. Yeah, that's that's a good okay. question. And sometimes we just have limitation that you know, you know, we cannot do anything about physics. Very true. So since we've got so many um, questions in the Q and A that we didn't get to answer, we put up Francois's Twitter details. So any questions that didn't get answered, feel free to reach out to him directly on Twitter. I'm sure you won't mind answering all of the. Uh, We've got about 39 questions there. You know, it won't take you too long to get through all of them on, on the Twitter. But no, um, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us today. And a big thank you to Francois for being our special guest to help us navigate through this challenging topic, which was how we design Wi-Fi for challenging environments. Um, lots of great tips and tricks here. So, um, no, I really enjoyed that today. So thank you very much, Francois. Thank you, guys. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you guys for having me. And I can answer questions, no problem. It was a blast. Thank you very much, Francois. Thanks to you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, marketing team at Agahau.